Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, June 15th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, it's patched Tuesday, and of course the patch we were all waiting for, which was the patch for CVE 2022-3190, or the Felina vulnerability, did get released, even though things were a little bit complicated here, in the sense that the release date for this patch was actually labeled as May 30th, so it didn't really show up in the normal uh, June patch Tuesday feed. But if you're applying the roller patch, this Folina patch is included and you should be good to go. Now, the patch fixes the command injection vulnerability in the diagnostic tool. It does not prevent the diagnostic tool from being started. So uh, this was when this vulnerability was first discovered, a little bit the question, what's the actual vulnerability here? And uh, well, the workaround actually prevented the uh, diagnostic tool from being started, but the patch now does allow the diagnostic tool to be started in a secure way, so it's no longer exploitable. If you wanna be careful, uh, then you may very well leave the workaround in place, so the diagnostic tool does not start. Haven't really heard of any sort of side effects of uh, that uh, workaround, so may as well uh, keep it safe and uh, don't allow the tool to be started. In addition, of course, to applying the patch, you definitely should apply this patch. Now, aside from the patch for uh, this Felina vulnerability, we do have yet another critical vulnerability being patched in Windows NFS. This vulnerability is, I think, the, th the third month in a row that we have critical vulnerabilities uh, being patched here. All of them, remote code execution vulnerabilities, haven't uh, seen any exploits for any of uh, these vulnerabilities so far, so may not be the Biggest problem here also only affects the most recent version of NFS, NFS version 4.1, which you may disable. Windows uh, NFS is not enabled by default, which also sort of reduces the attack surface here. And of course, does reduce the probability of someone spending a lot of time coming up with an exploit. And then uh, we uh, do also have a uh, another critical vulnerability in Hyper-V, another remote code execution vulnerability. This one scores in with 8.5. With about 80 vulnerabilities overall being addressed here, three of them critical. This is actually almost a little bit lighter uh, than normal uh, patch uh, Tuesday with, of course, the Folina vulnerability trumping everything else that's uh, being patched. Apply the roll-up patch and get it over with. Just for completeness, we do also have uh, patches uh, from Adobe. Uh, these patches affect Animate, Bridge, Illustrator, InCopy, InDesign, and RoboHelp Server. But the highest CVSS rating here is 7.8, and the priority for any of the patches that I took a look at is 3, according to Adobe, which is Adobe's lowest rating. And then we got a detailed blog post from Orca Security, who initially about a month ago told us about the Synlabs vulnerability. Microsoft back then uh, fixed the vulnerability. And in uh, this uh, more detailed blog post, Orca is going into all the details, what exactly happened here, how uh, the cross-tenant data leakage here really happened, and how an attacker could take advantage of this. Since this is something that Microsoft had to patch on their end. There isn't really much that you necessarily have to do, but uh, overall, uh, they're also stating how long it took Microsoft to actually uh, deliver uh, the necessary updates in order to fix uh, this vulnerability, which of course in the meantime did put customer data at risk. Interesting blog post. I won't go into too much detail here uh, because it's very sort of cloud and Azure specific, uh, all the different issues they're discussing here. So if you are working with Azure, definitely recommend that you take a look at this blog post because it uh, sort of very well explains how some of these uh, cross-tenant leakage issues may happen. 
And not a cross tenant attack, at least yet, but we got yet another sort of side channel a CPU data leakage vulnerability. This time they call it Hertzbleed, and it does affect a modern x86 processors, according to the authors of the research paper. Several researchers from the universities of uh, Texas at Austin and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, did collaborate on this paper. Also, one researcher from the University of Washington. The basic premise here is that the uh, CPUs are scaling their CPU frequency. So they're not necessarily running at a constant CPU frequency and how the frequency is adjusted depends on what data is uh, being manipulated. So by measuring the CPU frequency, you may be able to figure out uh, what is happening on the processor. In particular for cryptographic algorithms, uh, one of the important properties here typically is constant time, meaning that uh, the algorithm uses the same time to run no matter what particular ciphertext or key is being uh, processed. Well, uh, with uh, the processor adjusting the frequency based on the data being processed, this is of course no longer true and then leads to attack that may be used to actually extract cryptographic keys. Like many similar attacks, we'll have to see if it's more of an academic novelty or something that's actually exploitable sort of in the real world. Well, that's it for today. And just as a reminder, if you have a minute, uh, please give this podcast a good rating in your podcast platform or even better, leave a good, nice review so others will more likely be able to find this podcast. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.